What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Star Wars Explained. I have a great guest I am very excited to talk to today. He has written for not just Star Wars, but also Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica. He's written Knights of the Old Republic, Knight Errant, Lost Tribe of the Sith, Kenobi, A New Dawn, and most recently, The Living Force. Please welcome Mr. John Jackson Miller to the show. Hey, glad to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm in between uh, conventions right now, and uh, you know, we're in that run-up to the the new novel coming out, and uh, it is uh, just a very busy, crazy, but fun time. Great. Well, today we're going to talk non-spoilers. We're also going to record uh, an interview about spoilers to come out after The Living Force. So right now, I just kind of want to get to know you a little bit as a Star Wars fan. Uh, a bit of an icebreaker question I like to ask all my guests is who is your favorite lesser known Star Wars character? Someone who's not like your your Obi-Wan Kenobi's or your Luke Skywalker's? Well, the, 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 there's a couple uh, that come to mind and both you know, sort of uh, spring from the same place. Uh, you know, I read the comics uh, before I saw the movie, the first three issues of the adaptation, uh, the, you know, Star Wars 1, 2, and 3, back when they came in the plastic bags uh, that you would get at Walgreens. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, so the, the, so the, what we would later call the expanded universe was always part of this for me right in the beginning. And so one of the characters that I remember really early on, uh, was, uh, there was a guy named Jorman Thode, who was a used starship dealer who appears in one of the Archie Goodwin issues, I think issue 25, uh, or, uh, of the, uh, of the Star Wars series. And he's, he's just a creepy you know, use starship dealer. And I'm like, but you know, he's created this new character and this is what it looks like to, to live in this universe and how somebody like that feels about this universe. Uh, and, and, you know, not everybody's a star, not everybody's, you know, the main character. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, it would be fun to create a bunch more characters like that one day where, you know, these are, these are all characters who, uh, you know, they're on the periphery of the big events out there. Uh, but clearly they're responding to, uh, you know, having to sell Luke and Leia a spaceship. Uh, and, you know, they're having to, he's, he's having to say, okay, yeah, but the Empire, this, and the credits, and the, you know, the Republic, and all of this, uh, all, all, all of this, you know, is is through his eyes. And, of course, you would see later books of mine, you know, where I would kind of do a lot of that, uh, particularly in, the, you know, the Kenobi novel. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I know that, you know, I've mentioned probably several times before uh, my favorite really obscure character who was sort of in the movie was the fake Jabba uh, again that I saw in that very first, uh, you know, batch of comics that I got uh, where, you know, uh, they, they had shot uh, you know, a stand in for Jabba in case he appeared in Mos Eisley uh, and uh, Howard Shaken was just told to draw a random alien there which then became Jabba for the comics that um, uh, that Carmine Infantino and uh, and uh, again Archie Goodwin uh, did over the next few years. Uh, and uh, you know he sort of uh, I think he was a Nimbanel. He, he looked like a, a, you know sort of a, a mandrel or a monkey or something like that. We jokingly referred to him as Monkey Jabba. After the real Jabba shows up, and of course we realize that's not him. And you know, kind of this fun EU way of explaining who he was. And, you know, it came out of the, 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 the video, not the video games, but the, but the role-playing game books that West End did. Uh, and I can't remember if it was Pablo's idea or somebody over there, but, but it was, uh, the notion became, all right, he wasn't Jabba, he was Jabba's accountant. And he would just go places and he would, uh, you know, be, speak for Jabba, use Jabba's name. Uh, and so I decided to put him in the Kenobi novel and uh, make him uh, you know basically speak for Jabba there and and you know, sort of forwarded that conceit a bit forward uh, and then uh, when I did the Canto Bite novella that I did for uh, you know the book Star Wars Canto Bite for episode eight um, I brought him fully into uh, I, I guess the you know the movie canon by putting him on the casino planet uh, as uh, sort of the accountant and arranger for Big Stir Ganna, who was the guy that uh, it was running the whole show on that planet. Uh, and again, it, it, it's just sort of, it's fun background stuff like that, that, uh, you know, I, I, I think is amusing because you get these guys who have 
uh, you know, Wikipedia pages that are just pages and pages long. And uh, again, you know, that really, you know, you, you, I, I would say that, that, you know, the first example I gave is much more what I've tried to do, you know, more generally in the fiction uh, and certainly uh, in The Living Force, uh, which uh, you know, has lots of regular people uh, in the Star Wars universe encountering, uh, you know, characters uh, in the Jedi Council and otherwise and, uh, and you know, talking about uh, what their lives are like to them. For sure. That is probably the most deep cut answer I've ever had to that question. Uh, Jorman <laughs> Toad. That's, that's, that's kind of what I do, though, I'm afraid. I, I love both of those answers. I remember loving uh, the Jabba's accountant popping up in Kenobi. <laughs> and I, I did a whole video about Jabba's evolution from the the man that played him in the original film and then the comic version and then the yep. film version and then how you wrapped it all together. So yeah. much fun. Well, Star Wars books are in a really cool place at this exact moment in time where you have written the very first and the very latest canon novel, A New Dawn and the Living Force. So how has writing for Star Wars changed in the last 10 years, if at all? Um, well, you know, that was you know one of the reasons that uh, the Lucasfilm story group came about was to be able to make it easier for us to write stories in close proximity to the movies, uh, in close proximity to things that were actually happening uh, on screen. Uh, because again, you know, even 10 years ago, the notion of streaming TV series was also not something that uh, you know, people were really you know, quite aware was going to be uh, in the picture. But, you know, we did have the experience of, you know, having to write stories and then having to change things a bit this way or that way or this way or that way to tack away from or close to whatever George was doing in the movies or the animated series or whatever. And, you know, so a lot of, a lot of things that, that, that we've done over the years have sort of been uh, to, um, you know, accommodate, uh, you know, the, 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 the parts of the uh, story universe that have really different um, uh, production timelines um, it's a lot easier for me to make a switch in a comic book or even a novel to accommodate something that is, you know, being happening in animation or in a movie than vice versa. Uh, and so, uh, it is not necessarily that there's a pecking order between these things where, you know, something up here is, is more canonical than something else. It's more a matter of, we're a little bit, um, you know, nimbler in terms of, you know, we have a a a, a narrower uh, amount of time between when we're actually doing something to when it comes out. Uh, that it allows us to, uh, you know, respond relatively more quickly. And you know, if there needs to be a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, of of uh, you know, tacking from one thing to the next to sort of. Uh, adjust for something uh, that is coming up new content. It's, it's easier to do. Uh, and, you know, I think that is, that has been really helpful. Um, you know, when I started, uh, I was working a long way away from the movies. I was working Knights of the Old Republic, uh, you know, Lost Tribe of the Sith, um, you know, uh, you know, Knight Errant, which is, is back in a, in a new edition. So now both the novel uh, and the comics are all, uh, are all out again. Uh, and you know that's 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 wonderful that that story is out there. But one of the reasons that we were doing the story back then, uh, that far away, was because it was just easier to do something disparate from um, from the movies uh, because there were, there might be something coming up. Um, you know, I think the High Republic is a case where they figured out, all right, here is uh, here's something where we can design an area of the timeline. Uh, significantly closer to Star Wars uh, than my earlier stuff was, where it was a long way back, uh, and uh, and you know this this uh, this allows them to uh, you know really build up that world, uh, and uh, and and I think that that is very definitely um, you know a, a a consequence of you know kind of how they do things now, and um, you know it, it it's interesting. It is happening in all franchises. Uh, you know, where, uh, you know, what used to be 
uh, this ancillary content uh, that you know the the creators of the TV shows or the movies or whatever in 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 other franchises you know would not pay any attention whatsoever to what was going on in the comics or the novels or anything. But now we're in this world where you know um, a character. Well, uh, uh, everybody wants to talk about Ray Sloan, and I, I, I could talk about her. That's but, my very you know, next question. That's so. your very next question. So let's go, <laughs> on, let's go on into it. I mean, a character where I could say you know, right at the beginning, um, you know, this is a character that you can be used uh, again and again in other places uh, by design. What has it been like to see yeah. other creators wrap her into? video games and comics and books and, you know, people are crossing their fingers for future yeah. appearances as well. Well, I think what I said at the time uh, was, you know, this is, this is the character that is going to have the, 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 the most potential uh, for reuse after a new dawn, because, well, first of all, she survives, uh, which is not the case for most of the characters in that book. Uh, if I had really thought this thing through, because when I created the novel, I had no idea at the start that it was, it was going to sort of be this, you know, this, uh, you know, opening uh, moment for, uh, for things. Uh, I might've let more characters live, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Ray, sur Ray survived and uh, uh, Deltic, uh, Canada Deltic uh, also survived as well. That's uh, one of the, one of the characters that I was able to use in uh, the Empire Strikes Back from a certain point of view book. Uh, she's sort of the, the very, very weird science officer. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I, I like knowing that you're able to sort of fill in more moments of, of her career. Uh, and, you know, it, it happened in Aftermath. It also has happened, you know, she's appeared in uh, Star Wars Squadrons, the video game. Uh, they've made a Lego out of her. Uh, and, you know, I got to be, uh, I got to have the chance. You know, I, I wasn't gone from Star Wars between uh, New Dawn and, and uh, Living Force, uh, entirely. I was still doing a short story a year or a novella a year every so often. Uh, again, thanks to Tom Holler and Elizabeth Schaefer kind of keeping me in, in the, in the, uh, in the picture uh, when, when opportunities came along. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was hard for me to do anything else because I was doing a, a, a novel a year basically for, uh, for another franchise. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was, it was something where, um, you know, I, I was uh, glad to be able to elaborate on Ray in several of those stories and basically make her similar to, um, you know, uh, you know, Horatio Hornblower uh, in, um, in, uh, you know, British naval fiction. And of course the, you know, the science fiction equivalent would be Honor Harrington, uh, which is, you know, the, the space version of Horatio Hornblower <laughs> in the sense that this is a character that we're going to see at various times in her career. And so I've depicted her as a cadet and I've depicted her as, uh, you know, a, a, you know, captain who has lost, uh, lost her um, position uh, in part uh, because of the events of what happened when she appeared in the comic book, the Canaan comic book. Uh, and, you know, I, I just think that is, again, uh, yeah, going back to uh, you know the the monkey Java Mosep Benid character, the guy who was not really Java, but has now been used in like nine different media. Um, uh, I like having characters that uh, have that opportunity to appear in multiple different franchises, uh, not franchises, but multiple different multiple different uh, uh, formats. Uh, you know, and and I I think that's that's really cool, uh, and it is something which again. You know, 50 years ago, uh, you know, was not happening with uh, with this sort of uh, this sort of fiction. Um, you know, the books were there. The books uh, sort of stood alone. Uh, now they're part of a, a bigger thing. Yeah, and Star Wars fans definitely like it when their characters jump around between formats, too. I would say Ray Sloan has become uh, a fan favorite character that people love to see every time she appears. Oh, yeah. But uh, let's get into The Living Force a little bit. Your acknowledgments for the book point out that many of your previous Star Wars works have been about Jedi on their own, and that led you to kind of lean towards criticism of the Jedi Order. Did writing The Living Force change your mind at all? Um, you know, I, I, you know, before I was 
uh, doing this. Uh, I was a journalist, and before that, I was uh, uh, a, a a budding political scientist, or that was my that was my plan. Um, and one of the things that that uh, you know, I learned about first year, um, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, but um, uh, there was a, a, a psychologist named Ir- Ir- Irving Janis who ro- uh, wrote about what they call groupthink um, and how basically how organizations fail, uh, how uh, how groups uh, come to suboptimal decisions uh, because they get blinded by um, either their own sense of superiority, their own sense of invulnerability. Um, they, they, they become hostile to outside views. They become hostile to, to, uh, anything. Silence, uh, is often taken as, uh, agreement. Um, and, and this happens, you know, he, the, the, um, you know, he, he was using, uh, various things like the outbreak of World War II, Pearl Harbor, and, uh, you know, the Bay of Pigs invasion, all these historical moments and showing how, uh, you know, people just had this, you know, what they would later call uh, a failure of imagination to to recognize bad things that were coming. And I kind of looked at the Jedi Council that I saw in Phantom Menace, and which which this book is a um, a a prequel to. Uh, it, it celebrates the 25th anniversary of it. I, I looked at that as just running rampant in that organization at that time. Uh, that these, uh, you know, we have we have Qui Gon Jinn, who is sort of the outsider, literally to the circle, uh, who will come in and they will just sort of go, uh huh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, it's him again. Um, it's 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 him again with the with the balance of the force and the, you know, and things have been, you know, this organization has been in position for us so long, and there are people who have been on this council for decades, centuries even, who are really just embedded in those seats. Uh, And I had kind of written about this um, in a much darker way, uh, in a much heavier book, uh, The Big Knights of the Old Republic, (laughs) where the Jedi of the Knights of the Old Republic era, which in some ways is similar to the to the you know the uh, the high republic era in the sense that it's a it's a it's a good time for the jedi at least until things go wrong um you know they are they are um they they make some really really bad decisions and i i wanted to look at the jedi council here and and basically have them really um you know, take a look at in, inward um and so when when tom suggested to me you know he said he said we'd like we'd like to do a jedi council book i said um i i will i i'm, I'm delighted to do it my first thing out of my mouth was i want qui-gon jinn to walk into the council and call them on their um inertia call them on what they do and say, you people have to get out of the ivory tower here. You have to actually go out and look around and see what's going on because um, this, the, the, the story of the prequels is a story of uh, an organizational failure. It's the, it's the story of a failure of imagination. It is the story of a failure to see what's going on because they're looking, you know, elsewhere or in the future. They're being distracted. They're being misled by Palpatine, uh, of course, uh, who uh, who wishes us luck on the book, by the way. That's, uh, that, that's him right there at, the, at GalaxyCon uh, in Richmond last weekend. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is this is this is something where I wanted to I wanted to uh, to show this. Now to get back to the earliest part of the question, which how did, did my view of them change? Um, yeah, uh, I there's some nuance because there's twelve different people here, uh, and I I wanted to show that there were several people on the council that were sympathetic to Qui Gon right off. Uh, even Peel is sympathetic. Uh, Yaddle is sympathetic. Um, you know there there are also others that are. Um, you know, a lot more uh, hidebound in, in terms of, you know, this is our role, this is our job, this is, you know, we're not a, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not here to solve everybody's problems, uh, and and I really wanted to 
to uh, do something where I put them all out somewhere in the field where they have to kind of live their philosophies uh, and see whether those philosophies stand up when they collide to things. So, so yeah, um, I've, I've raged quite a bit in that answer, but I, I think that, that that is, that's really kind of the way I approach this is, um, yeah, I started out a lot more skeptical of the Jedi council. I'm probably more sympathetic to them now. Uh, but I also uh, see exactly why this was able to happen to them. I I think that's a great answer. I, I like when people talk about the institution of the Jedi Order, uh, yeah. and I think that that is, uh, what would you call it, a failure of organization? Like, I think that's right on the money. But if you look at individual Jedi, yeah, they're clearly the good guys of the story. And so some, some fans will kind of be like, oh, the Jedi are just as bad as the dark side. It's like... Uh, no, but their institution had flaws. So yeah. I, I really appreciate that answer. Um, without spoilers, what member of the Jedi Council was the most fun to write for and who proved to be the most challenging? Um, you know, I had to look through everything that uh, had happened with these characters in the past, every place they had appeared and what was officially in their biography, because, you know, we did have some elements early on that ended up getting superseded by um uh, uh by attack of the clones in terms of uh you know what their original backgrounds were uh and uh i i sort of had a look and see okay well what is uh, which of these characters do i have uh, a lot about known and which of these characters do i have very little known and the characters that i had the least about tended to be the ones that i have the most fun with because i can go wherever i want uh, well not wherever i want but i can <laughs> Uh, you know, I, 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 your rail poof again. That's the character. that's you know, kind of a he, he, the running joke in, in you know, was it robot chicken? Is nobody ever lets him talk, uh, and he's always late to things. And I said, you know what? Okay, uh, obviously he can't be a complete and utter fool because they wouldn't let him stay. Um, but I, I took the notion that he's been there so long, and he's always been sort of the character that's you know, uses the, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for stuff. Uh, he, he's always the mind game, practical joker kind of player. And I'm like, okay, right now I, I'm going to write a guy who's just, he's really kind of over it. Uh, he's, he's, he's been doing this for a very long time and, uh, and his mind just works a little bit different. And so, um, you know, I, I got to write him. One of, one of the best things about uh, this book is, it's not just writing the characters, but writing multiple characters uh, together where we actually are able to show that these relationships didn't just start yesterday. Um, you know, we're we're actually in the middle of hundreds of years old arguments between some of these characters or 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 or, or relationships so that we get um, this this dynamic with uh, Uriel Poof and Kiati Mundi where you know it, it really is you know Uriel just sort of picks on him and and just tries to annoy him on purpose just because he's bored and uh and Kiati is like yeah I know what you're doing I know what you're doing I know what you're doing and um I, it's just not gonna work and uh, and you'll have uh, I think Apo Red Cesus has some sort of a line like yeah I I I I used to you were you were much different once and you're not an improvement <laughs> right now and again you know it was not me you know it, it's you know, I, I, this was not me canonizing the robot chicken version of uh, of, of your rail poop at all but I, it was it was an experiment with um, you know a character who uh, I I figured might have a different outlook at this point. Um, because when you're starting to deal with characters that are hundreds of years old, uh, and just have seen a whole lot, uh, yeah, you, you, you wonder you, what is getting them up every morning? Uh, you know, what, what, what is, what is, where, where's the variety in life for them? And this is a guy who's uh, kind of entertaining himself by entertaining others. I love that you took inspiration from the robot chicken. Uh, it's a, I, well, it's not that I did, but it's like, I'm like, I, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can kind of rhyme with this a little bit uh, because, I, because again, it was possible. Um, I think I maybe subconsciously picked up on it because I, I mentioned the robot chicken sketch in my review for this book more because 
I thought it was great to actually see the council be a council and have discussions. Oh, yeah. Whereas in the movie, you know, that's just not feasible. You need to yeah, have just yeah. like Yoda, Mace, and occasionally Kiati Mundi chimes in. Uh, so it's a great joke in Robot Chicken, but I, I loved that we got to flip it and actually see them have discussions <laughs> in this book. Uh, <laughs> uh, since I brought up uh, your favorite background and side characters. Uh, do you have a new favorite side character that you inserted into this story? Because like you said, there's a lot of kind of slice of life telling uh, 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 with the Jedi Council and where they go. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if, uh, well, okay. Uh, I know we're, I know we're doing a non-spoiler version of this. Uh, if it can't be done, we can save it for the next part. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I can, well, I can, I can, there, there are, there are a variety of of characters that are are just a lot of fun um and i wanted i wanted to um show the jedi interacting with people who were in the middle of personal crises uh but some of those personal crises were more serious than others uh and so we have a we have basically a a, a you know a, not crazy cat lady, but we have we have somebody like that that Eth Koth interacts with, and I thought this is this is this is this is fun with him because again he's he's very stoic and 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 polite, and the last thing he wants to do is say, "Madam, what are these ferrets crawling all over your 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 body? What what is this about?" Um, so so that's fun. There are uh, the the. Uh, in particular, I would say my favorite character to write uh, in in this uh, was a uh, a certain um, uh, a, a certain naval captain, uh, and uh, that is that is somebody who uh, I know I, I know we'll probably get up at, get get to in the, in the second one because I don't want to give too much away about him, but again, that is a character that I had written before. And um, I think if people uh, go go uh, go do some research, I, I I hope that they look that character up after they read the book, and not before. Uh, but uh, but uh, but yeah, no, there there are multiple characters like that. There there's uh, there are three characters who are, are sort of uh, uh, you know they kind of function as comic relief in this in this book. But there's a lot of comic relief in this book. <laughs> and again, uh, you know they uh, they they they're they're fun. They, the, the the interesting thing is this book is you know to go back to what we said in the beginning um this book is full of german thodes this book is full <laughs> of those characters who live in the star wars universe but aren't the heroes and so they're they're always observing on things we have a you know one of those uh two-headed uh uh, uh characters from uh again uh, uh from uh, from phantom menace uh where both halves of the character are are part of a uh a, a, you know a, a a political talk show where they argue with one another um you know uh, but they concept, all have points by the way. <laughs> they also well, they all, yeah it's got to be misery um to be around <laughs> them uh, but they all that they, they 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 all have these points of view and uh that that's another one of the fun moments of the book is is there's there's a there's a line where they they they'd say yeah we haven't figured out who's going to support this and who's going to be against it yet uh <laughs> whatever this particular topic was uh it, which just you know kind of shows that, that what they're doing is showbiz uh, but I, I I wanted to kind of show that where um, you know this 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 already is a, a book that has uh, twelve point of view characters in the council uh, plus uh, you know Qui Gon plus Obi Wan plus the villains uh, at, but they all are meeting people they're all interacting with people so um, you know this uh, this book can say this book contains thousands uh, and I am. <laughs> Uh, I am really uh, thankful uh, that uh, Mark Thompson is still talking to me uh, because he would have had to have created quite a few voices for this, uh, this book for the well, audio book. Yeah. Uh, we will start to wrap up our non-spoiler section, but I saw online that you'll be attending dragon con for your third year this later yeah. day. Uh, that's my favorite con I'm from Atlanta. So we go every year. Uh, just curious if you had any fun moments that stand out to you in the past couple of years that you've been. Uh, Dragon Con is different from any other convention that I've gone to, and I it has taken me a while to figure it out. 
uh, because it, it, it you know, it's not a traditional convention that's all in one place. Because there's the you know there's the uh, there's the dealer room building, but then there's also these five hotels that things are happening in. And so yeah, I had uh, yeah last year on Friday I had events in five separate buildings on, uh, and I was running from building to building with uh, uh, with my uh, my trusty sidekick who is uh, helping me carry the books along, and uh, and uh, you know, just just getting from place to place, uh, and uh, it, it is. Uh, it, it, it's always fun to run into people who are either dressed as your characters or, you know, have some connection to it. Um, you know, a, a, as we're recording this, I'm just about to do mid South con, which is another one of these Southern, uh, conventions. It happens to be the one that I grew up with, uh, in Memphis. Uh, and, and that probably has, uh, you know, my favorite, uh, cosplay encounter because I had, uh, I had done, uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, and uh, the fans there kept wanting to dress me up as one of my characters, uh, and I don't cosplay. I'm terrible at it. I was, uh, I went, yeah, I went at that convention. You know, when I was a teenager, I went as the world's saddest Indiana Jones. It was depressing, <laughs> uh, and I never did it again. Um, but uh, but they wanted to uh, to do something for me. I said, well, I tell you what, uh, why don't you um, uh, come up with a costume for? the Griff, Griff from the um, Knights of the Old Republic comics. Uh, but uh, here's a deal. It's got to be the exact size of the costume uh, of the character. And I said, I'm safe now because that character is uh, three feet tall. And when I got there the next year, uh, the fan group had a Muppet, life-size oh. Muppet uh, with, the, with the Griff. And so I ended up having to carry the Muppet around for the entire time. And uh, we, we did a reading uh, for one of his short stories with the, with the Muppet uh, being, being, uh, being uh, yeah, operated. And I, I, I drove Griff back home in the uh, back seat of the car. And the woman at the drive through window said she thought it was the ugliest child she'd ever seen. <laughs> uh, it just, but again, those are the kind of moments that, that will happen at these conventions where you'll be like, okay, I can, can't believe anybody would ever go to this trouble. Uh, to do all this. Uh, and I, you know, I have, as I say, I've never had any talent whatsoever for costuming. And uh, uh, it, again, it's wonderful that there is this additional venue or this additional way for people to enjoy, uh, you know, this franchise, uh, you know, apart from uh, the other, you know, collectibles, the other you know, novels, the other, the other things that we do. Well, I was going to ask you what other cons you had coming up, but you answered that. So yeah, that's, where... well, that, 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 that one's coming up right away. Uh, I, I have a, I have a full slate coming up and uh, the, uh, and since this is before the launch uh, of the book, uh, we are doing three launch events in Wisconsin. Uh, the book is being launched at the Barnes and Noble in Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, Tuesday, April 9th. Uh, and then April 13th, uh, in at one o'clock, I'm at the Barnes and Noble, uh, West Town in Madison, Wisconsin, and then I zip over to um, Milwaukee for my first Milwaukee uh, uh, signing. Uh, at uh, at the I think it's uh, it's one of the two malls there. <laughs> it's on my website. Uh, and that and that's that's at six, uh, and uh, and we will have Living Force posters available while they last. Great. Where else can people follow you online and keep up with you? And do you have any other uh, books or works that you'd like to tell Star Wars fans they might like, even if it's Star Trek? We, we have oh, a lot no, of Star Trek okay. fans. Too. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the other books that are out right now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Night Errant is out in a new, uh, new uh, uh, Legends Essential Edition. And that means that both the comics and the novel are out because the comics are available in uh, Old Republic Volume 5. Uh, so that's coming out. Um, the, uh, Knights of the Old Republic's epic collection uh, gets reprinted, the very first one. So the cycle is starting again, finally, after all these years. Uh, and that's a book that had been very expensive, and uh, but it's getting reprinted. Uh, that is, uh, that's coming out, I think, May 21st. Uh, May 14th, there's another one of these big omnibuses, but it is Rebellion Volume 2, and that has my very first uh, story for Star Wars, because I did an issue of um, Star Wars uh, Empire, uh, uh, Star Wars Empire number 50, uh, 30, 35, uh, and so that is getting reprinted in that. Um, other things that I, I have out, um, uh, early in April, the um, the trade paperback version of my um 
uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds novel comes out. Uh, that's the first Star Trek novel with planetary maps in it. Of course, we have maps in the uh, Living Force as well, and that's a ray map in the Living Force as well. And also the Barnes & Noble special edition of that comes out the same day as uh, the uh, the regular version. And that Barnes & Noble edition has a poster which has a double-sized color version of the map on, on one side, and that's very cool. So that's a whole lot of stuff coming out, and <laughs> uh, and I haven't even gotten to all of it. But uh, you can find me on farawaypress.com. That's my website. I have essays on most of my books there. Uh, and then on uh, on Twitter, JJM Faraway. And then on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads, uh, at John Jackson Miller. Great. Well, I'll have links to all that in the description. Thank you again so much for talking non-spoilers with us today. Uh, we will be back in a couple weeks to talk spoilers all about the living force. But until then, thank you all for watching and may the force be with you.